Welcome to another episode of the Major Outcomes Podcast. Our guest today is Marie-Louise Lehmann from Deloitte. Marie-Louise Lehmann is an executive with more than 15 years of experience in the fields of finance and agile transformation. Currently, she's the chief of staff to the CEO and COO of Deloitte Consulting Germany and EMEA, as well as the office lead for the CXO and Agile Finance Lead. She's also the founder of Finance Goes Agile, a think tank for agility and corporate finance in mostly German-speaking countries, where she, with others, tackles topics such as controlling and finance in volatile times, sustainable budgeting processes, effectiveness and efficiency in finance departments, but also agility and flexibility of the finance function overall. Last but not least, Marie-Louise is a regular speaker and an author, as well as a lecturer at the University of Luzern. Marie-Louise, did I forget anything? No, thanks. That's, uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Perfect. So let's get right into it. This podcast, Major Outcomes, is all about how leaders and organizations define their most important goals and what they do to achieve them. So we do talk a lot about outcome-centered strategy, about execution, goal setting, and collaboration. And as you are a leader with a focus on finance and organizational adaptiveness, I would say, I would like to start our conversation with a question that might sound a little bit provocative to the finance community, but How well would you say is the finance function today integrated into the strategic planning processes, into the goal setting of the enterprise? Um, I do know we work with companies and we have people in our community who would say, well, there is a strategic planning process and there is a budgeting process. Those two are not necessarily one thing. And, and finance will definitely monitor if we are on budget, but not necessarily if we are getting ahead with strategy or if we achieve the right kind of outcomes, business outcomes, customer outcomes. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective on that? Well, first of all, I think um, it is fine that it's not one plan so that you have a strategic plan and you have a budget. Um, I, would, I would even say I would recommend to do it that way. Um, but um, coming to your first question, how has the strategic planning a place in finance? I think in, um, well, kind of like past times, um, the, the budget kind of like, you know, planning on historic numbers and, you know, increasing them by a share of wallet, for example, or, you know, planning of organic growth really did the job and hit some sort of the strategic plan. Nowadays, as the environment becomes so volatile, um, this kind of like two things don't necessarily lead into the same direction. So while it does make sense to have a look at past numbers to learn for the future, that doesn't necessarily kind of like fit, uh, fit you know, the, the overall goal of, of the strategic plan. So I think we, we need to have a look at, you know, strategy and strategy execution and interlink both plans. Yeah. So I, I think that's sort of the, the first part of this conversation. I, I oftentimes feel like um, when talking about strate strategic planning and goal setting, um, it's underestimated how much this is a relevant topic for CFOs and the finance community. Oftentimes when we talk about goal setting methodologies like OKRs, um, I think it's perceived as something where people might think, yeah, that's something we do in HR, right? Goal setting, breaking down um, strategic goals into departments and on an individual basis, um, not necessarily something that's that's driven and and on a day-to-day -day basis influenced by, by, by finance and the finance function. Um, Why is that? Or maybe also, do you see that changing? Well, yeah, I think uh, it, I, I think there is an explanation for that. And it's really, you know, when we look at how, you know, market and market demands have, have shifted. I mean, finance functions in the past did a very good job in, you know, kind of like predicting the future by looking at historic numbers. And this is why 
for many, many years and decades even, this was really doing the job. So it was about, you know, efficiency. It was about, you know, scaling of whatever was there. And um, when finance departments did a good job in analyzing historic numbers again, you know, um, they, well, yeah, they, they did not value add to the, to the um, business because the business was in some sort predictable if we even look at, you know, supply chains and demand planning and so on. So um, a lot of this was really done by analyzers. Nowadays, as the environment becomes volatile and not as stable anymore and business cases have changed we don't have these clear correlations in the products anymore so we have as a service components for example we have life cycle products we have organizations that shift its organizational structure towards product-led organizations they need to be steered in a totally different way and plus the product they are delivering to the market is different. So of course we cannot um, accept to um, you know use the same steering methods we used in the past and just you know assume that this will work for the future. This is not saying that it doesn't work at all. This is just saying that it doesn't does not give as much of advantage as it did in the past. So I'm really thinking that we need the same amount of well, if, if you say management innovation, as we need technical innovation in order to, you know, tackle this pro uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite quotes in that context to what you said in the beginning is like, uh, steering the organization only with financial data is like driving a car only with the rear view mirror. And I think mm -hmm. that, that pretty much nailed it. Um, and, and yeah, more and more leaders, more and more companies we work with, um, I think, for them, this is a major topic, right? Um, that exactly as you just said, budgeting feels like an old management technology from a century ago. Um, the bank is only open once a year. Income mm -hmm. and expense for the next 12 months are spelled out with very strict precision. Um, and, and this somehow more and more, yeah, there's more and more friction to how the organization from a strategy execution point of view as, as well, um, yeah, plans and execute and then continuously adapts, needs to adapt to, to the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have a business model that really fits into this, you know, stable world and this that's still planable, then this will do the job. But as we see that, you know, business models shift towards hybrid, towards a lot of, you know, intangible products, well, again, this is not doing the job anymore. And I think there's the need for, you know, looking at strategy in a rather different way and combining the, the fiscal planning and the strategy execution um, in, in, you know, a new kind of like uh, method or way throughout the year. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I, I think looking back at the year 2022, we don't have to make a case for an increase in in the magnitude and the frequency of change, right? An increase in, in volatility. This certainly has been a year for, for many organizations and most leaders, which has been particularly challenging in that regard. Um, so we don't have to really ask like, why now? I think there is a lot of examples and, and lots of context why this is becoming more and more pressing. What are some of the general trends and changes changes that you now see driven from the finance function or from the CFO community. Um, we hear a lot of companies talking about new ways of thinking, some of them not so new if you look closer, uh, like, like mm -hmm. beyond budgeting. Um, so what do you think if we keep it on a, a higher level of principles and, and general approaches, mm -hmm. um, what, what is changing right now um, and, and what has to change from your perspective? Yeah, so I think um, maybe starting with that, the requirements are still the same. So in finance, it's obviously still about, you know, um, optimal cash flow and, you know, putting resources where they are most effective and efficient. So this hasn't changed. The answers have changed, right? And um, we see that um, methods or frameworks or whatever you want to call them, such for example, um, 
beyond budgeting, as you mentioned that, but also OKRs are coming in people's um, view of being a, a solution to these problems. What I sometimes think is that people do tend to jump into conclusions rather quickly, saying, OK, we need to implement OKRs, we need to implement beyond budgeting. And I feel that they sometimes kind of like forget to see, you know, what kind of challenge am I facing and what of the methods and tools we have around from the Agile Toolbox, for example, can, can do a job there. So for me, it's not that much about using a framework and kind of like heavily implementing this into a certain, uh, a certain environment, but rather um, being sensitive about, you know, what the real challenge is and how we can kind of like um, help as, as consultants, but also, you know, as people facing these challenges with the toolbox um, that's offered. And um, there is no one fits all to use, uh, solution. I, I don't have to tell you this. You will have kind of like made the same experiences there. Um, and, and certain methods in certain regards work for certain companies and for others, they need more adaption, which is totally fine, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely made similar experiences. And I think uh, what strongly resonates there is uh, when you talk about um, not just jumping to conclusions right away, not, not seeing like the silver bullet in in new approaches, new frameworks, new methodologies like OKRs. Mm -hmm. um, as the outcome management company and as a big believer in the outcome economy, we uh, we are very convinced we need to start talking about um, what outcomes do we want from that steering process, from that operating model. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's where it oftentimes gets complex, right? It's, um, I think one reason why also the the whole movement around agile is is sort of like burned in many organizations because you're just before talking about what's the vision for our organization why do we need to change uh what do we expect from these changes you just um buy into those those new approaches to um supposedly uh um solving the, those problems um and then where i think it gets complex is where those different functions are depending on each other or need to be integrated, right? When when we mm -hmm. help organizations to implement new outcome-centered planning and collaboration processes, sometimes with OKRs, um, sometimes with other methodologies, but no matter how you want to call it, um, you might have an easy start when you, you just focus on, okay, how do teams now break down strategic goals? How can they define their goals bottom up? You can achieve mm -hmm. major improvements already, but then at least after like, yeah, after I would say one to two years, you realize there are so many other steering processes that are existent and 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 then they define the reality of those teams. So you need to have a plan how how they are integrated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we can have a look at like traditional portfolio management processes and and how they are in change because that's usually like the biggest, I, I think the biggest roadblock or one of the most challenging processes to integrate with those new approaches to steering. Um, as I said, when we help organizations implementing a new strategy execution process, um, it's relatively easy because there are in many cases, you you can land on a green field, right? Teams defining goals that contribute to the strategy uh, in a more custom oriented, in a more measurable, in a more cross-functionally aligned way. But then there's this other process where actually someone else decides about who gets the headcount, what kind of projects, what kind of output gets, what kind of budget. And of course, this is a, a very important and political process that also defines power and direction. Yeah? So mm -hmm. I think how do you bring those processes together is, is, is definitely one of the biggest questions I face on a on a day-to-day -day basis working with these kind of companies. Um, mm -hmm. Have you experienced similar things? And, and where do you see when we talk about portfolio management, where do you see things moving? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we have seen kind of like plenty of, of examples there. And um, while they are all kind of like having the same bottom line question, the degree of, you know, what a solution would be is, is rather different. 
Um, so for example, um, when you see organizations transforming towards, you know, being more agile product led, having, for example, the safe framework Im implemented, um, that's a choice that a lot of, you know, huge corporates are, are doing with their IT functions, for example, then we are usually facing the problem, you know, how the finance function um, budget those value streams for example and how um the the yeah the the, the budgets are um, allocated um throughout the year because the fiscal planning doesn't fit um the terminus of of the safe framework right and um having a portfolio management in between usually you know is one good solution for um for for making this work Saying this, a lot of the times, the 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 root or the, the yeah the the cause of the problem is rather coming from the way that the responsibilities are addressed in the company. So when we look at that, I mean the the financial department kind of like could more or less easily um, adjust their financial circles to the needs of um, the safe framework, for example, in, in that degree. But since they are sitting in, you know, different sea levels, for example, this is just kind of like not happening. So it's usually a lot about, you know, finding a compromise or finding something that kind of like fits for both purposes, right? And a portfolio management and also um, OKRs, for example, can do a very good job in translating and helping, you know, achieve a some sort of yeah common ground that that fits both needs, right? So I rather call it a glue in between, um, and I think a very good glue, by the way, um, because yeah, we can serve both um, requirements. But what you say also means that these kind of changes and, and integrations uh, of processes, having the glue work somehow, uh, can only be driven from the very top, right? Yeah, totally. I would say that this is one of the road blockers, um, well, stakeholder buy-in, if you want to say so, right? But I think this is this is true for kind of like every transformation, every change you're driving. And especially what we are seeing in the operational functions, so organizations moving towards more agile approaches. I think this is especially um, heavy to digest for finance functions as they are used to pushing the structures into the organization. So for decades, the finance function was the one saying, you know, how the whole organization is steered, how it's managed, you know, by their cost center structure and so on and so on. And what happens now is that as the operational functions um, change their, their operating model more towards you know, customer centricity, meaning then, for example, value streams, but also other forms of, you know, bubbles or tribes or whatsoever, yeah? And um, this feels like a push towards finance. And this is not a nice feeling for, for no one, right? So on a very personal level, um, there's a lot of, you know, pressure to change. And um, if this is coming at a kind of like very end of a transition, um, where some time pressure on that also, then um, I, I do understand totally the, the ressentiments <laughs> that they are facing on the, on the CFO um, agenda there, you know, and, and usually it's not, not within their um uh, uh, perceivance or perspective at that at that moment so yeah 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 what i experience a lot is that i think to some extent this has to be about redefining the role of finance but also different roles within finance uh roles around the portfolio management process for example and in many cases that we experience we see that it feels like yes uh this promised land or that that future uh, it is promising there's um 
so much more data possibly available to to steer more proactively uh, to get more agility also into the portfolio but those new processes are sort of like still all in beta and and companies mm -hmm. are ex experimenting and then there's a i think that the new world will only work if the function here also lets go of some of the old parts but there's there's that like i think lack of trust uh in in where things go where things are going and um yeah i think i think it's a lot about actually enablement training um mm -hmm. but on the other hand also we're we're still in, in in many cases looking for how can those step by step changes happen where you don't have to do the big bang but but slowly go step by step right i do understand and uh, just had a conversation with one of our um customers uh, cfo in the it function that they would love to have more information about what outcomes, what customer value will be driven by certain investments, certain budgets. But the quality of data, of course, um, if you were to steer with that, if you were to make decisions based on that as a CFO or someone from that team, um, you, need, you need a certain level of quality in that, right? You need a certain level of governance that um, in many cases is not, is not implemented yet. Um, so it, I think it starts sometimes with with very simple things like getting a some kind of an order into the different kind of metrics, right? Is this a financial lagging indicator that's about the, the traditional P and L metrics, or is this more like a leading indicator that um, this team actually can use to define are we creating customer value? So I think it, it starts with those kind of basics, but that's just one thing we experience. Do you see any other gateways, any other um, doors you can go through to to build trust and to have that change happen step by step well i think cross functionality is you know one of the biggest thing and um including people into you know decision making and being transparent all of this is something that um, agile approaches give you, but are also a requirement in, in order to be successful in, in such a volatile um, environment. And um, again, I think also listening to, to what you said, I think we are coming from a, um, we are coming from target operating models of, of companies that really perfectly fit a very stable, predictable world, right? And we are in this in-between phase, you know, where um, all these departments have learned that they need to change. And there's, you know, change coming from different directions and different perspectives. And um, I feel that very often this is getting a bit messy <laughs> in these companies yeah. because, you know, while they are company, and this is especially true for, for huge corporates, um, there's like so many approaches towards, you know, what change look like and what solutions look like. So I think bottom line, it's really about, you know, aligning and, and, and focusing and about, you know, being on the same road and running into the same direction <laughs> while being there. Right. And I think, OK, our can help you perfectly do that. And that would then also increase um, the value adding of the finance function because this is about efficiency and effectiveness, right? So this is really kind of like closing closing the circle there. So I think OKRs or frameworks such as OKRs can really help a finance function do a better job in a volatile environment or do their job in a volatile environment because it's a lot about connecting the dots and i mean having a responsibility over resource allocation for example um brings along some sort of you know need for control but then at the end it is an illusion because the future is not predictable, right? And and you said this with these beyond budgeting approaches. I mean, they are digging in exactly the same direction, saying, you know, we have conflicts between strategic planning, targeting, you know, forecasting where we say, okay, this is what we think will happen. 
and um, then the the resource allocation. And um, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot in frameworks such as OKRs combined with other frameworks that that can do a brilliant job there to to solve these issues. Mm -hmm. I know this is a, a sensitive question because I feel like all organizations are in transformation and are still in the middle of those changes, which on that level that we're talking about here is probably more a transformation of a decade and not something that happens in, mm -hmm. in two or three years. But do you have any, any like role model cases or any um, interesting examples from companies where you can see them at least on an, on an interesting journey that others can learn from? Yeah, I think there's, you know, a couple of kind of like advanced um, companies um, where you can also find kind of like case studies um, in in the internet and stuff like that. And I know they have done plenty of, you know, also talks and and um, meetups around that. So one would be um, Roche, um, Roche Diagnostics. They are very, like to me, they are a role model in that um, they have, um, approach beyond budgeting very early in their stage but um, again also they wouldn't say that they have used all of the model you know um, they have an a OKR approach that they don't name OKR approach but rather you know outcome based planning they um, work with rolling forecasts and event driven forecasts so I think they have adapted very, very well towards these, you know, um, volatile environments. But still, for them also, it is about um, being adaptable and constantly learning and and reflecting. So I don't think these transformations will be done as in finished. You know, I yeah. don't think we will have these finance transformation twenty twenty five or twenty seven things anymore because it, it is really about you know constant adaptation and and one thing i'm always saying to to cfos is you know i mean if you're planning your finance transformation for 2025 and you are done then by you know whatever the requirements are now there's a very high likelihood that the organization and its demands have changed so you're you know three years behind again so it's not really about, you know, finding a certain status quo in the very future, but rather being connected to the business and finding a way of aligning with the business and supporting the business. Um, I even sometimes think we need a new framing of finance departments that are doing so. I think HR, for example, did a good job, uh, even a great job in, in being named, you know, people and culture. I, I mean, nowadays, when you see departments being called people and culture, you know, it's not about, you know, classical HR topics, but about so much more. It's yeah. very much about value adding and things like that. And I think we need the same amount of um of change and uh, you know innovation in, in finance and if somebody that's a shout out if somebody finds a good phrase for that <laughs> i would be highly interested in in you know finding uh, finding a phrase how, how we can call that i was thinking down the road of you know finance as a service or something like that but then maybe people would say okay as a service you know i'm not serving somebody then i'm only doing reports that's not doing the job so yeah Finance as a service, okay. We we take that one suggestion, and then <laughs> maybe someone in the audience has some more suggestions and reaches out. I, I'm sure there's better ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's true. I I just feel like um, it, it's definitely like the different functions are sort of like going through those evolutions where a lot of the topics we both care about and we both work on. Um, uh, have been driven a lot by IT and product related functions, probably starting already 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of like in the finance community is, is, is also now accelerating. I think one, one term that I'm interested in, or I, I was, I was intrigued uh, about is like behavioral finance because it, mm -hmm. it sort of like takes into account that finance is not just about 
sort of like uh, numbers throwing, flowing through through the organization. But really, mm -hmm. um, it, you have to think about how how do people and people still being the best uh, resource to deal with volatility and onward looking planning and and reacting to to change. How mm -hmm. how do you integrate that view and these data that you can get there as well? better in, in how you plan and steer and forecast uh, and control and monitor, of course, um, with the finance function. So that that's really yeah. interesting. Um, I think there were a couple of really interesting things. And what, what you said, um, I fully agree on the constant change. That's something we've been talking a lot about in, in previous episodes as well, um, that this is not a transformation with an endpoint. And um, uh, I think the, also when we talk about organizational adaptiveness or agile, I think the the key thing is to apply those principles that we're we're talking about also to how you develop the organization, right? You you have a first version, and after three months, after six months, after nine months, you you evaluate what what works and what doesn't, and the role of any kind of leader, not just a finance leader, is to constantly work on the system as much as to work in the system. Obviously, so I think that that's yeah. really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think the other thing is for me, really the golden threat to what you're saying is it's not so much about designing the perfect new operating system, but much more about who comes together and, and what's the foundation has to look like to make change happen into the right direction mm -hmm. um, where, yeah, all relevant functions have to be be part of it. Yeah, and I think that's what we see see working out there quite quite well. Um, you can implement a new planning and goal setting process like OKRs, which initially gets new principles into the organization of more bottom up and top down planning, more outcome and customer centric planning, more team oriented planning, and also planning and collaboration process that's much more focused on um, value streams and, and cross, mm -hmm. cross functional um, dependencies, if you like. And then from there, I think it's just important and, and that's something where we see organizations fail in the past is to not see it as something that can be driven by one part of the organization or one function because then it's it is the hr process which it never should be mm -hmm. alone uh, it should also not be the finance process it has to be some like the overarching operating system and best case all of those functions are sitting at the table from the first day on and not everyone might be integrating their processes with the new thing. But I think building trust like that is something that we've seen work um, quite a lot and, and then really very much following that um, that iterative approach. You know? mm -hmm. And I mean, through OKRs, you can foster these changes, right? I mean, you can kind of like rebuild the way we look at finance from a kind of like rather control department towards a true business partner and what you were saying earlier about you know information cfo needs or data in order to make good decisions i feel power to the people right they need exactly the same yeah. metrics and data and so on so being part of this value chain as a finance function and being some sort of maybe even internal consultant to the business right um, can lead to smarter decision making when it comes to resource allocation. So when they, you know, build, you know, new software and, you know, they are in between kind of like moving into two directions or they are in a certain point where they say, am I doing this feature? Am I processing here or there? Or we have, you know, some conflicts. I mean, this is something where, where finance can really have a value add. And um, I think they should always have done that, by the way. This is nothing new, but it, uh, new, yeah. but it becomes even more relevant in how we set up organizations nowadays. And this is a, a huge chance for, for every finance department to talk about, you know, bottom line value adding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The like finance becoming a, a new kind of sparring partner and, and these kind of strategy execution processes um, is, is, is definitely a way to go. I, I agree. And that's something we do experience that um, 
yes, more and more finance is also the driver and the initiator of those new steering and collaboration processes. But oftentimes, they're sort of like, in the past at least, been a bit more hesitant to to follow because I do understand um, like letting go of um, at least some of the details of how you allocated budget um, and and just following a new goal setting process, which goes from an annual cycle to a quarterly cycle and um also building on 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 other kind of metrics um mm -hmm. this can feel like you're losing control you're losing uh you're losing transparency you're losing accountability so i think the the thing we've seen work is um step by step from the first step yes have finance there as a sparring partner and then also let the function experience what kind of new data is, is actually there, right? Suddenly, mm -hmm. if, if you if you implement an OKR process in a in a sustainable and an effective way, suddenly you have so much more leading indicators that tell you so much earlier if certain strategic targets can be achieved, will be achieved. And um, I think before then letting go of some of the bureaucracy of, of those kind of portfolio management processes we all know, um, I, I do understand that it first takes like, also seeing some of the new tools, some of the new metrics that help um, at least enriching the way finance can steer there. So that's that's uh, something I, I see there a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, we I'm trying to sort of shift to um, other constraints and challenges. We, we touched upon why this transformation is difficult. Um, we mentioned one or two examples where... Um, where um, companies are maybe leading the way and and, and experiment uh, experimented a lot. So if I try to summarize what you said so far, why is that kind of change in finance difficult? We mentioned it requires cross-functional collaboration and it requires really like change at the very top. This has to be a C-suite initiative. Um, oftentimes, we, earlier we talked about IT transformations, right? IT alone, no matter how how big and powerful they might be in your organization, they are not in a position to change the global portfolio process or other processes that they, of course, are a part of. Um, I think you, you talked a little bit about ownership and, and stakeholders, right? Who, who drives that and then who feels responsible for what? Um, and you also mentioned that there's, I think that's, yeah, I, I call it earlier the golden thread that there is no blueprint. Yeah, you cannot really mm -hmm. implement like one new operating system, one new methodology, but it's 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 very much a step by step approach that should base on where is this company right now, where do we want to get, and then iteratively getting there. Are there any other constraints, challenges, maybe also cultural constraints um, that make the kind of changes we've been talking about so difficult? I mean, there's kind of like things that are true, not especially for finance departments, but obviously for, you know, other ones as well. I mean, very often it's this, you know, jumping into conclusions so that people feel there's a need to change and then they find something as, for example, OKRs, and then they say, okay, you know, that's the golden bullet and, you know, let, mm -hmm. let's implement that and all problems will be solved. So. And then there is a fear of, you know, having yet another process compliance in there, you know. It is also about how you implement that. I mean, there's different strategies on, you know, implementing um, OKRs or any other um, agile framework. Um, you, you, have, you can have these big bang approaches that are rather, um, Drastical, but you could also, you know, um, have a look what what's a good what's a good pilot um, to tackle. My recommendation would would be start with low hanging fruits and you know increase this amount of low hanging fruits as you learn and you know get more um, security in the process and and um, you know your risks more um, as an internal but also external um, stakeholder. Um, I mean, we, we talked about um, management buy-in. Um, I think one thing is also about, you know, clear ownership. So um, methods such as OKRs, they need 
roles and they need some sort of you know processes and procedures and events that you know make it work at the end so um i think you should put some thought into into that and you know decide who is doing what and then also upskilling kind of like um people in order to be able to kind of like do that and then some sort of persistency i i've seen yeah kind of like absolutely. companies that have started with okr in this sort of you know this is solving everything approach and then they kind of like started it and you have a three months um circle and then you know the daily business hit in yeah. and you know and then they kind of like lost track and at the end it it was the method's fault rather than, you know, the way it was kind of like approached and thought through. And um, this also kind of like uh, brings me to, to the last point. I would really always try to make the method fit the circumstance rather than the other, the other way around. So, for example, we do have companies that have to learn that there's an advantage in having a three months or four months cycle rather than an annual cycle, but they haven't kind of like solved their internal kind of like structures, you could even call it problems of having an annual strategic goal and having many, many people aligned toward that. So when you kind of like give them a framework such as OKR and say, okay, you have to slice it down into three months goals now and then, you know, go from there and all what you have done is dead and this doesn't really fit and you need to, you know, change this and that in order um, to fit um, the, um, the theory of the OKR framework. I think this is doing rather harm than good. So um, especially as, you know, somebody kind of like implementing this and um, I would rather go for the advantages and see how I can, yeah, adjust the framework to the needs while keeping in mind that there's also room for improvement for yeah. that company that they may be when they have learned how this works and the roles are settled and the events are in place that then we can have follow up discussions on, you know, wouldn't it give you an advantage to, you know, go, go down to maybe six months circles and, you know, learn on the way. There's a lot of good change management advice in those, in those statements as well. Some more, some are good points for the list, not just what are constraints, but also how to deal with them. Um, so persistence, hundred percent, that's, that should be on the list. And I really like what you said, like, basically you said it shouldn't be perceived as yet another new thing, right? Um, like really go from what do we have today? What problems do we want to solve? And then how, where, where are the low hanging fruits? Where are the starting points? I think not yet another layer is something we, we hear a lot um, mm -hmm. and rather showing how can we pick up what's there? How can we enrich it, improve it, iterate on it by bringing in some of those new principles it, it's not about a new goal setting process. It's about how can you get those principles of customer centricity, decentralization, like more cross-functional planning, et cetera. How, how can you get that into how you plan? Because no matter how you call it, no matter met, what methodology and approach you use, you probably will have to plan and, and will always need something how you plan. So I, I really like those points. Um, mm -hmm. And Looking at the time, I realize we already have to come to the end. I'm aware today, this was our very first conversation and um, we, we try to like narrow it down, try to get some, some perspective on uh, how to steer an organization in more volatile times from a finance perspective. Uh, I would love to, to continue that conversation. Maybe next time really talk about one or two case studies, examples, um, I mean, there's there's a couple of topics that we're working on also together. Um, but for today, I think that was a really good introduction. Um, and before we come to the the end, there's like always in this podcast some personal questions um, that are, I think, always interesting for the for the audience. So let's get right into that. 
books. We always like to list books and other sources. Um, do you have any books and book recommendations that you would share with the audience, maybe in the context of what we're talking about today, but also beyond? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, I love books, um, that to say, and I think there's a lot of, you know, great books out there where you can kind of like pick bits and pieces and, you know, kind of fit that to your own puzzle. And um, a, a very, well, dear recommendation of me always is Managing for Happiness by Jürgen mm -hmm. Aslo. I really like to come back to this book every now and then, because I think he's got a lot of crazy ideas where I think most of them wouldn't fit into normal corporate life. But yeah. being able to, you know, kind of like have this perspective and maybe kind of like review things in a different way is really good. Then um, you mentioned Beyond Budgeting. I haven't read it yet, but I know that Beate Bogsen has just published a new book on Beyond Budgeting. And I have read his last one and I'm a huge fan of him. Um, so I think um, this is also kind of like a Christmas read even. Yes, for <laughs> and, holidays. Um, I mean, not only talking about books, but um, of course there's from the finance perspective, a lot of good magazines that are tackling these things to only name a few. Um, the um, controlling and management review of um, Utz Schäfer from, from the WHO, mm -hmm. and then um, also the controller magazine, which is doing a great job in you know giving attention to, to all these sort of um, things. Very cool. We'll put all of those into the show notes of this episode. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, Jürgen Apollo, not the first time he was recommended in this podcast, but Managing for Happiness, new on my list as well. Any other, like if we're talking about media, any other favorite podcast that you like listening to? Okay, well, I, I do kind of like there's only one podcast I'm listening to on a regular basis. And this is kind of like really due to the fact that I have hard times following the news. Mm -hmm. So I'm always listening to Lage der Nation. I've been a fan for, I think, three or four years already. So um, this is something I can write, uh, yeah, highly recommend to people that have, um, yeah, kind of like timetable issues as, <laughs> as I have them. <laughs> and I, I just really like to, you know, put in certain kind of like topics into my Spotify um, search algorithm and then, you know, just listen to whatever comes up. There's really brilliant ones from, from the US and Britain. So I can recommend to, you know, also broaden the horizon there and um, have a look at what's, what's outside. Harvard Business Review is always, always going to work. Uh, and then um, I think not digging too much into your very own bubble, but rather extending this and, you know, rather really listening to, you know, other people and finding solutions to, you know, their problems. I think um, very often we can we can learn from that just by the way how they approach things. Yes, uh, that's that's so nice. It should be probably the closing words already. But I do want to ask, where can the audience, where can our listeners find out more about you? And maybe also where can they engage best with you? Yeah, I think probably LinkedIn is a good um, channel to, to contact me and to get in touch. Perfect. Then, Marie-Louise, thank you very much for your time. It was great having you on the Major Outcomes podcast. As I said, it would be amazing to continue the conversation soon and for today. For today, I, I wish you all the best and uh, yeah, thanks for spending the time with us. Thank you very much, Johannes. So that was fun. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in today. Pause of this conversation with Marie-Louise probably requires some finance background. So please have a look at the show notes where we added further resources with subject matter content and background knowledge. If you found this episode valuable, please subscribe to the Major Outcome Podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any other major platform you might be using. Also, if you have any feedback or suggestions, you can send us an email to podcast at workpath.com. Last but not least, of course, we'd be excited if you'd leave us a review. This helps us grow the community and spread the outcome mindset. See you on the next episode.